Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are going to let more attendees fill in just for the next couple minutes, and then we'll get started. All right. I think we can get ready to kick it off. Welcome everyone to our webcast today. My name is Olivia and I'm going to be our moderator. And we're so excited that you've joined us for this session on how to prevent the use of AI tools during online exams. Uh, there will be poll questions throughout this, so please participate. We really like to see your feedback, as well as uh, questions are open. So if you have a question, please drop it in the chat or the question section, and we'll either answer it then or get to it at the end. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off with our first poll question and then I will be handing it over to Jordan. So first, our, for our first poll question, we're gonna ask how familiar are you with recent AI tools and how they work? So you should see this launch and we will give you all a few moments to answer that. All right, I see we have a few more answers rolling in. Give that another moment. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and close that poll and share these results. So it looks like the majority are somewhat familiar, Jordan. <laughs> Awesome. Pretty good sweet spot. So that's should be well suited for today's presentation. Nice. Thank you all for participating and keep an eye out for the other poll questions. All right, I'll hand it over to you, Jordan. All right, thanks so much. So uh, before we kick it right off and get into things, I just do a, a quick brief introduction um, to my for myself. I'm the VP of product here at Honorlock. I have my background in teaching elementary and middle school, spent about five years doing that before getting into ed tech and the product world. Um, my entire product career has been spent in assessment and more specifically, really geared towards uh, secure assessment. So now that uh, ChatGPT is mainstream, you know, we're all trying to figure out how do we adapt and what does it mean for the world of academic integrity? I, I don't think we at Honorlock or anyone has all the answers yet, but I hope today's discussion can really teach everyone a little bit about AI chatbots like ChatGPT, and then also open up a dialogue around the options that you have to protect your assessment process. So to make sure that we're speaking the same language, there's sort of two different types of AI tools that we're going to include in today's presentation. Things like ChatGPT, uh, which are essentially chatbots and some other similar tools to ChatGPT would be like Google Bard, uh, Jasper, Bing AI. The other side of things that we'll discuss for a bit are extensions that are geared towards cheating. Uh, an example of this would be the transcript extension. Other ones are Coursology, Quizzard, QuizWiz. These extensions allow a student to essentially overlay buttons into their exam window and when they see a question, click a button to get an answer and it's going to tell them, hey, there's a 78% chance that the answer is A out of these multiple choices. So I just wanted to kind of define those two groups or categories of AI tools so that we're uh, understanding what we're talking about as the presentation progresses. First, let's kind of, let's take a look at how is it that ChatGPT was built, at least the basics, and how does it learn so that we can understand maybe how it might evolve in the future and, and what its present state uh, really represents. So to be clear, I'm certainly not on the inside of the OpenAI team or ChatGPT, but researching and looking at a variety of interviews that were done by the OpenAI team, the people that specifically 
worked on ChatGPT, we can get a pretty good picture of the key milestones in their training process and how that all ties together. So first, there's a, a step called pre-training. Pre-training is really where the development team and the team working on the project are gonna to try to load up as many resources as possible that can be used to train the language model. Uh, so you're looking at you know, millions of resources and what you end up with at the end of this pre-training step is really a large language model that will really spit out anything because what it's trying to do is predict the likelihood of what the next word should be in a sentence. The simple way that I like to think about this, imagine you're texting on your phone and you have you know, predictive text that's gonna kind of suggest what that next word can be. That's essentially what you end up with in this pre-training phase. Obviously take that and multiply it by a million in terms of how many resources are being put in to the training. Whereas you know, your texting is trained really more on your own behavior, but that's what pre-training is all about. Getting a model that can predict what the likelihood is of the next word. Phase two of training a model like ChatGPT is around fine tuning. This is where you attempt to tune it by teaching it what type of responses a human user would actually prefer. Um, and what ChatGPT, their team referred to this as supervised fine tuning. Where, so what would happen is they would create a prompt, then a team of experts on that prompt, 10, 20 people would create a variety of responses. So let's say each expert produces 10 possible responses to that prompt. Then those prompts, or then those responses, excuse me, are fed back into the model. So now you're actually using human produced work to teach the language model. Here's what a human would expect when you're presented with this prompt. Phase three is really all about evaluation and feedback. The GPT team calls this the re re uh, reward model. This is where ChatGPT will now respond to the prompts. They'll produce, let's say, 10 responses. And now humans are going to rank those generated responses based on their expectations and which ones they feel most align. So if there were 10 responses produced by ChatGPT, the human team would then take them and rank them one to 10, feed that back into ChatGPT so they understand, hey, this was your best, this was your worst response, make it more or less likely to produce a similar response like that in the future. And then step four, which is the phase that we're in today with ChatGPT 3.5, which is the one that most everyone's utilizing, this is where you deploy the language model and you iterate. And now the, they're receiving feedback from everyone, right? Millions of users are utilizing ChatGPT. And after you've had it generate a response for you, you can give it a thumbs up, a thumbs down, let it know how well it did in responding to the, the prompt that you provided. And then that, again, is used to feed back into the model and continue to train it so that it evolves and improves. So now that we understand a little bit about the basics of how ChatGPT was put together and what it's capable of, let's discuss how it works when we're talking about AI and plagiarism detection tools. And in order to kick that conversation off, we're gonna pose another poll question for the group. So we're asking true or false, ChatGPT plagiarizes content from the internet. We'll give this one a few minutes to have responses roll through as well, so we can get a feel for the audience's opinion and how we feel on this one. All right, so everyone should be seeing the poll. Take a few minutes to, a few seconds, give some thought and respond. So ChatGPT plagiarizes content from the internet, true or false? Also, while we're waiting for some responses to come through, I do see some questions coming in. Please keep them coming. And I will attempt to, to answer some live uh, if I'm able to, to catch it. Otherwise, we'll be sure to circle back at the end of the presentation to cover those. 
the first question that we had come through uh, while we're waiting for these responses was if we use an iPad app for our exams, are these tools a threat? Uh, this, the short answer to that is yes. Um, ChatGPT is certainly accessible on an iPad. Uh, and also, you know, a student could utilize a second device to potentially access it as well. All right, so we've got 58% uh, saying false, 42% saying true. So um, those of you that responded false, Congratulations, you are correct. Uh, ChatGPT does not plagiarize, and we will explain a little bit more as to what it really does do so that we're all aligned. Like I mentioned before, kind of using that text message example, a language model's function is to find the probability of the next word in a sequence. That's essentially it, like in a nutshell. Um, if you have 10 sources, let's say, all talking about the scientific method, each one might explain the scientific method some, somewhat differently, right? There's going to be different words, different explanations, different sentence structure. All of those things are going to differ based on the source. The model is going to take the aggregate of those 10 inputs, and they're going to try to create the likeliest sequence of words on that topic. So what that means is, there's not a single one of those 10 sources that's being plagiarized. It's a combination of all 10 that it is creating a algorithm, uh, a formula to try to predict what word should come next. Now, take 10 sources and multiply that by hundreds, thousands, and you start to understand the likelihood of one specific source being plagiarized becomes essentially zero. Um, what this also means, because ChatGPT is not plagiarizing from the internet, it means that there, there's this concept called hallucinations, which is when ChatGPT or any AI chatbot really just makes up non-existing or wrong information, uh, and it will present it as if it's factual. And the reason is because it's not actually looking at a specific source. An example here would be, I, I once just kind of toying around with it, asked ChatGPT about the history of HonorLock as a company, right? And it produced a story about how HonorLock started, who, who was in charge, all of this stuff. And some of it was very accurate, but there were two or three just absolute falsehoods mixed in there because it wasn't citing one specific true source. It was trying to utilize bits and pieces from a variety of sources. One, um, I don't know, asterisk or caveat to this is when I when I'm talking about what ChatGPT is doing, we're talking about today's version, which is 3.5. There is another version that exists not yet for public use, uh, GPT-4. GPT-4 does have some element of internet access, which means that it is going to be better at um, citing actual sources. And so far, the early results, as far as I've seen from the OpenAI team, is that GPT-4 is 40% more likely to produce factual responses compared to GPT 3.5. So keep that in mind that this is a, an ever-changing, ever-evolving world. I also saw a question come through, you know, is what I just described still plagiarism, not just direct plagiarism? I, I certainly am not arguing that that's academically honest, what I described, right? So we, we want to try to discuss how we can stop students from utilizing that to whatever you would categorize that version of aggregating different sources and putting it into different language, whether you would consider that plagiarism or not, isn't too relevant in, in the regards to what we'll continue to discuss, because what we want to do is we want to figure out how that no longer matters. How can we prevent students from doing that or modify our assessments in a way that um, you don't mind if they use ChatGPT? And we'll discuss both of those in just a bit. So now that we've defined you know, the difference between, um, or we've defined that the, the fact that AI chatbots are not plagiarizing directly from the internet, depending on how you want to define that, uh, let's talk a little bit about the difference between plagiarism detection and AI detection tools, because there are tools out there that do both of these things, but in different ways. Plagiarism detection is really about an application looking through their database and seeing what percentage of a student's submission matches what's in the database. And that database could be sources from the internet. It could also be sources from past student work. 
and it's going to look for uh, it's going to compare you know SA A against SA B through infinite number that are in the database, and we're going to try to find a percentage of of a match. AI detection applications they are doing something a little bit different. They're trying to predict if that content has been human generated or AI generated. So it's looking at things like the structure, the length of the response, the predictability, the complexity, and it's trying to then assign a likelihood that that thing was produced by AI. So certainly two different purposes and two different um, features within a, a, an application that would be trying to do these two things. And you know we're familiar with dozens of companies that are doing both plagiarism detection and AI detection or one or the other. So when we consider how uh, these tools are going to perform when we try to feed it an AI response or any type of response that's coming from uh, a student or chat GPT, what are, how's it gonna work and what are the tools gonna look at to produce the percentage likelihood that it's was, was created by AI? And it really all comes down to the prompts. Um, if your students or, are using basic prompts, then the tools are very accurate. You know, this would be, you see the example of the basic prompt up on the screen. Describe macroeconomics in one paragraph. If the students are getting a little bit more advanced and they understand that they should use a semi-detailed prompt, which you can see on the screen again, that's gonna decrease the likelihood of the tool being able to identify it as AI-generated content. And then if a student uses a very detailed prompt, the likelihood decreases even further. So I'll show you a few examples of uh, these levels of, of prompt detail and what type of results we, we got in our testing. So beginning with the basic prompt, we tested over a variety of about a dozen different tools and we took the average, right? So certainly not gonna name any names about scores or anything like that, because that's not what this is about. The dozen tools that we tested on responded with an average of 85% likelihood that this response was AI generated. And again, this is using the basic prompt. As we progress through to the semi-detailed prompt, the score dropped significantly. Now, the average across those 12 tools was only at 30% likelihood that these were AI produced. And then when we moved on to our detailed response, or detailed prompt, excuse me, that likelihood of AI generated content reduced down to 2%. In addition to this, there's, you know, there's other little tricks to the trade of how you can get around some of the AI detection tools. Some examples, uh, we had one where uh, after ChatGPT produced a response, all we simply did is responded to ChatGPT and said, hey, the response that you just gave me was flagged as AI generated. Please generate a new response. And after giving it that additional prompt, the likelihood of being AI generated, the score or the percentage went from 99% to zero. Uh, that was on a smaller batch of testing across three different AI detection tools. So just that little tweak, letting ChatGPT know it was flagged as AI generated and asking for a new response was a easy way around the, the detection. The other, the other thing is, you know, you can ask ChatGPT to write a response in the tone of a college junior and include one typo. Uh, that one produced 99% or went from 99% likely down to sub 30. And again, on three different detection tools tested. So the real, the key takeaway here, right, is not so much the specific prompts that can be used to, to game the system, but the, the key is the prompt and how a student or how anyone utilizes that prompt plays a big role in how effective or ineffective any of the AI detection tools can be. So I wanna pause briefly and I'll also take a look at some of the questions that have come in at the same time as we're responding to the poll. So at what AI or plagiarism score percentage would you feel comfortable taking action? So we know that this is going to be a percentage match if we're talking plagiarism, or it's going to be the application's prediction of this is the likelihood 
that this thing was produced by AI. So we've got a few different options there for you to select from. And I'm definitely curious to see how uh, universities and schools are utilizing these results today, because I know a lot of us are using these tools. So I see um, some questions around like specific companies that uh, do they pick up chat GPT, right? So just generally, let, let me back up just for a second. So when we're talking about AI detection tools, um, yes, there are a lot of companies that will do exactly what I just described. That, that will give you a percentage of likelihood of AI generation. Um, and, and that's what they're going to provide you, right? And I think there's uh, there's no proof as to what tool was used or what AI generation uh, generator produced that content, but it's trying to give you its best guess as to was that content produced by an AI chatbot somewhere. Um, and so that's what those tools are attempting to do. All right, so looks like we've got a good number of responses through. Very interesting, spread relatively even across the board. So greater than 90%, we have 14% of the respondents, 76 to 90 at 22, 51 to 75, 26 to 50. And I think this just really goes to show you that there's no, I don't know what the right or wrong answer is here. Um, I don't think anyone does, probably why the, responses are so spread. But uh, as you kind of take into account what I just showed of how those prompts can change th those percentages so drastically, it makes it difficult to set a standard and say, every time above, you know, 75%, we're going to do X as an action. So hopefully, um, you know, we're talking a lot about kind of the, the problems, but I, I think now we can get into what are some of the solutions now that we've laid the foundation of what we're up against and how can we now evolve to live in this new world and maybe in sometimes leverage AI and also block it if we need to. And so final poll here, have you redesigned an exam or assignment due to concerns about learners using AI tools? Because as we start to talk about our options here and what we can do, that one of those options is always change, change the assessment. Um, we may not know how to yet, and that's partially what I'm going to talk about here in just a moment, but I'm definitely interested to see, is this something that you and the audience have already began or are planning to do in the near future? And this could mean, you know, modifying your question types. It could mean totally changing the questions you present on an assessment, or it could be changing the, the style of assessment that you're even planning to give your students to try to be chat GPT proof, for lack of a better term. Uh, again, I'll take a few questions while we're letting the responses come through. I did see a question about what are the AI detection tools that are being used. Um, I don't I don't know if there if this is reference to what we did in our study. I'm certainly not going to call out anyone by name to try to uh, play that game. But common AI detection tools, right, are Turnitin, CopyLeaks. Uh, those are some of the big names in, in the game, and those are also tools that can detect plagiarism. And it's very common for apps that were originally designed for plagiarism detection, you know, years ago have also added in some element of AI detection. So when I talk about those tools in general, hopefully that gives you a good clear idea of which we're talking about. And again, not necessarily the ones represented in our percentages earlier in the presentation. All right, so let's see what we have here for our responses. So 35% of you have already redesigned your exam or assignments due to some of these concerns. We've got a good chunk, you know, nearly 60% that 
have not yet done it, but certainly plan to, and then a, a very small fraction that are, are not planning to. So what I hope is that what we'll cover here in the next batch of slides, for those of you that are thinking about modifying your assessment, maybe it'll spark some ideas, give you some tips on what you can do. And then for those of you who maybe aren't planning to do anything, I do think there are some pretty simple kind of low hanging fruit options that maybe you would consider introducing to your assessment process if you haven't already. So first, let's talk um, exam tips. I've sort of painted the, the problem of ChatGPT, but I do also want to kind of play the flip side for a bit. And, you know, AI is more than likely a tool that students are going to want and or need to utilize in their professional future. No one knows what that future is going to look like, how GPT, how ChatGPT is going to evolve. But um, you know, at Honorlock, we use AI as part of our product. So I certainly don't want to paint AI as the boogeyman that must be stopped at all costs. Uh, I think there are ways that we can incorporate it into our assessment process that can be a, a, a real learning experience for students and also for uh, educators as well. So the first example, and this is something that I've talked with a few professors that have done this already with pretty positive responses. You can assign your students to debate against ChatGPT on a specific topic and assign a set number of rounds for that debate. So as an example, um, you could provide the students with the initial prompt. It could sound, or it could be something like this. I wanna debate you on the question, do public libraries have a role in the future? Uh, and then the student can choose their side of the argument. They would say, I will argue in favor of library's role in the future and you will argue against it and the you being chat GPT. And then the student would say, you know, here's my opening argument. And they would go ahead and type their opening remarks on that debate topic. After they finish, chat GPT is going to then respond with its rebuttal. They can go back and forth for any number of rounds. You know, maybe you want to assign three or five back and forth between the chat GPT and the student. And then at the end, the student submits that transcript as their assignment or their assessment. And you can see the students' responses, you can see chat GPTs, and hopefully get a good feel for how, how well the student kind of understood that topic. From the professors I've talked with that have done this, they mentioned that the students loved it. They even just the fact that they were opening up and including ChatGPT as part of the assessment process, they appreciated and they kind of appreciated the open minded approach. And the professors also mentioned that they found it to be fun um, and interesting. The second option here would be requiring your students to use ChatGPT to generate whatever answer they're going to get to. But instead of grading the ChatGPT response, you're actually going to focus more on the prompts themselves. We talked earlier about how important the prompt is related to you know, AI detection, but really the prompt is also very important to you as an educator to evaluate the student's understanding of the topic. If the student is just giving a very generic prompt, there is a good chance that they're not gonna get a great output from ChatGPT. And there's also a chance or a pretty strong likelihood that the student might not understand the topic as thoroughly. If the student is giving a detailed prompt and then not only doing that, but waiting for ChatGPT's response and then tweaking it with a further prompt and another prompt after that, they're using and they're working with the AI to get to an outcome. And that I think is where the value will lie, you know, in their professional lives in the future is how can AI augment the human and make them better? How can the human work with AI to get to an acceptable outcome? So in that scenario, you'd be focusing more on the prompts than you would be on the, the AI generated response. Now, those are both fun, uh, but also time consuming, right? Because as a professor, instructor, you might not have time to grade lengthy transcripts coming out of ChatGPT. So we also need to think about other ways that we can prevent the use of this and protect our assessments. If you have a large class of, you know, 200, 300 students, this is probably not a scalable way to assess them. Uh, tip number two here is about setting clear expectations. 
I know that sounds obvious and it's something that, you know, we all consider when it comes time for a syllabus, we try to set expectations for the course, but in this new world that's kind of been flung into students' laps, you know, unexpectedly, I think it's important, even if you don't have institution-wide guidelines yet around how to deal with AI tools, set the expectations for your course. What do you want students to use AI for? What do you not want them to use AI for? And I think um, we've seen a statistic within our honor lock data that I kind of find heartening. Uh, we have a feature, which I'll talk about a little bit later, where we block uh, specific extensions that could be used for cheating purposes. A lot of these are chat GPT or other AI chatbot, you know, extensions. And when we introduced the feature, um, you know, students would show up for an exam, we would tell them, hey, we're going to shut down these extensions because they're not allowed and they would be blocked. Interestingly enough, when the students return for their next exam, about 60% of them are already coming back with that thing disabled. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, right? Sometimes maybe they never re-enabled it in the first place. But I think what can be maybe pulled out of that is when you make clear to students what is and is not allowed leading into a test, they're coming back ready. Hey, let me shut this thing off. I know I'm not supposed to use it and let me get ready for my exam. Uh, I'd like for that 60% to be even higher, but I find some uh, comfort in that in that number and knowing that students, once they understand what's expected of them, the majority of them are going to try to deliver on those expectations. So what are some other things that you can do? You can cite specific resources and case studies. So thinking back to earlier in the presentation, chat GPT responses and, and AI chatbots in general, they're simply trying to predict the most likely next word in a sequence. So if you can get specific with the sources that you require, then ChatGPT is not going to be able to reference those specific resources. It's going to take the thousands of resources that was fed into it to try to produce that response, not the specific fact or specific detail that you've got stored away in your uh, primary source. They won't be able to get to that. That could change again in the future with GPT-4. So let's all be aware that this isn't a permanent solution. But in today's world where GPT-3.5 is what's being used by most students, the, this is a way that you can increase the likelihood of that hallucination that I referenced and decrease the likelihood of a good GPT response getting returned. I would also strongly recommend setting time limits. There's um, our internal data shows us that the longer a student continues on in an assessment, the likelihood of some type of academic dishonesty does increase. So by shortening down the available time, you're essentially giving students less time to poke around and figure out a way to try to cheat or work around the rules. Um, less time to navigate to GPT and work back and forth with it, less time to navigate to any resource for that matter and see if they can find answers. So those shortened time limits, they help prevent those opportunities to use any outside source, in including ChatGPT. And then finally, what does Honor Lock specifically offer that can help you protect against ChatGPT and others? So number one, uh, we offer Browser Guard, which locks the student into their exam window. We've seen that about 13%, this is aggregate across all exam takers, about 13% of students try to navigate away from their exam window during a test. And this is blocked or flagged because Browser Guard is in place. So that's something that is just prevented. Um, and now you have, you know, 13% of students that I'm not saying they're trying to all navigate to ChatGPT, but in theory, they could be. So you have 13% of those that are kind of nipped in the bud with Browser Guard in place. Honor Lock's recording your desktop, assuming you turn you, you elect to turn that feature on during your exam. That means you have evidence of what's going on during the test. So it's no longer, you know, you don't need to be reliant on any uh, percentage score that an application is producing or any data point for that matter. You have video evidence of what went on on the student's testing screen during the exam that you can reference and build a case if you need to. Like I mentioned on the couple slides ago, we also block 
AI extensions. This includes things like ChatGPT uh, and Transcript, as we mentioned on one of the early slides. And we found that about 3% of students show up to an exam with one of those extensions enabled and ready to utilize during the test. So we shut those extensions off and we don't allow the student to re-enable it during the exam. So again, that's 3% of possible cheating incidents that just get shut down right, right before they even enter the gate. Honor Lock can prevent copy and paste if you choose to turn that feature on. So if a student is trying to navigate out somewhere else and maybe you have, I don't know, some elements of browser guard turned off or you're allowing certain uh, access to certain resources, you can prevent a student from copying and pasting from ChatGPT or anywhere else for that matter. Again, 3% of students attempt to either copy or paste in an exam, and that is blocked once uh, with this feature turned on in browser guard in, in companion. Honor Lock does speech detection, which includes kind of key uh, keywords. So there are some voice activated AI applications that are leveraging ChatGPT, where you don't have to necessarily type to it, you can just speak to it. With our version of keyword detection, we're gonna be listening for some of those key phrases that activate those AI tools. And then we're going to flag that and get our proctor uh, involved quickly so that we can get the student back on track. We also will check for the room if you have uh, check the room if you have room scan enabled. So that'll help us make sure there are not secondary devices in the area, notes or other resources. Because even though you know we're locking down the browser, the other key component to that is we have to make sure that secondary devices are also protected against because nothing could stop a student could very easily just pull up chat GPT on their phone, get a response or an answer, and then transcribe that, you know, via typing into their exam window. So in addition to these features here, we've also really focused in on the secondary device detection element of what we do. And we have by far the most expansive uh, secondary device detection. You know, we have search and destroy, which is a great preventative tool to make sure that your content has not leaked online. Um, what will happen is when you enable Honor Lock on your exam, we're going to search the internet for all of your questions and see which ones are out there. We're going to batch up those, res those results and we're going to let you know which of your questions are unique, meaning we can't find them anywhere on the internet, which of them are compromised. Those are the questions that we found on between one and five websites. And you will be able to send a DMCA takedown to those sites with one push of a button if it's content that you actually own. And then we'll also let you know which of your questions are just prevalent all over the internet. We found them on more than five sites. And really what this is all about, it's, it's about you being proactive and having the tools to modify that exam if too much content has leaked. Interestingly enough, over the past three years, if we were to compare pre-pandemic to post, the quantity of leaked questions online has increased from 12% to 36%. So in about you know 2020, 12% of your exam questions may be online. In today's world, it's a stronger likelihood that it's 36%. So search and destroy is a vital tool in trying to get ahead of that. We have multi-device detection, which is um, a patented feature that only Honor Lock has, which helps us prevent students from Googling and finding questions online. And the great thing about multi-device detection is we really want it to be a deterrent where if you know we catch one student using it and then students understand, ooh, that student got, got caught with multi-device detection, we want them to just avoid Google, right? And say it's not worth the risk. Because most students, again, they're really trying to take their assessment honestly. And if you introduce any element of risk, it's not going to be worth it to most students. And that's uh, multi-device detection can be a great tool in that realm. We've also recently added uh, Apple handoff detection, which is, again, unique to Honor Lock, where we're able to determine via our own custom AI trained model, does a student have another device with a Chrome browser active, with Safari active, with uh, text messages, a whole variety of applications on another Apple device. And we're able to identify that. And again, get our proctors involved as quickly as possible and try to get that second device removed from the area. And in, in, in conclusion here, kind of to wrap that up, uh, to, to hammer home the importance of the secondary device, over 70% of the human verified violations that Honor Lock discovers are tied to mobile phone use. So it is by far the number one method that a student might look to utilize for any type of academic dishonesty. So having tools in place to 
prevent that is, is really vital. All right, so I hope that that gives you some options and some solutions. Uh, I'm going to skim back through some of the questions here. I see there's a, a pretty good amount um, and see if I can answer some in the last uh, bit of time. So we have, and Olivia, if there's a way for the, the questions to be shared, definitely feel free to go ahead. Otherwise, I'll just click through and read them out loud as I, uh, as I find them. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, we did have a lot roll in. So if your question isn't answered, it's just because we are trying to make sure we get um, all of them kind of grouped. So I've just yeah. been sending them over like that in batches. Okay, so I'll read them out loud. So what AI detector or detectors do you prefer? So I don't have a preference. Uh, and really what our stance is on the honor lock side and my own personal one as well is I think that you are much better off trying to prevent versus detect after the fact. Uh, all of the experimenting I've done has shown me that trying to detect after the fact is not accurate enough. I, I think to meet um, kind of the stringent requirements of needing to take a student to like academic court and, or whatever that follow up process might look like at your institution. So I don't have any thing positive or negative to say about anyone in particular in the AI detecting realm. But what we're focused on is really preventing students from getting access to chat GPT. Uh, because if we can do that, it eliminates a lot of headache for you at the institution. You don't have to deal with building a case around maybe muddy uh, evidence or dealing with all of that hassle uh, because it's just been stopped because browser guard was in place because you know blocking copy and paste was in place. So that's really what we're focused on. Um, and then someone put this in, I'll kind of paraphrase the question. They didn't understand the percentages that were being shown on the chat GPT slides or in terms of the AI detection tools. I'm actually gonna cycle back to the slides just so that we can all be on the same page. So what these percentages show us, it's in its simplest form, how likely does the AI detection application think that this was uh, produced by AI, right? So if, if a student put in that prompt, describe macro macroeconomics in one paragraph, and then chat GPT produced this response, you would feed this response in to any AI detection tool, and they're gonna give you a percentage. And they're gonna say, hey, we are 85% sure that this thing was produced by AI. And then as we see the progression of the prompts, if you were to take this chat GPT response and feed it into the same tool, now that AI detection tool is gonna to say, we are now 30% confident that this was AI produced content. And then if we moved on to the detailed prompt, that same tool would say, okay, we are now only 2% confident that this was AI produced. So that's what that score represents. It's essentially a confidence score of how likely that content was to be produced by AI. Hopefully that clarifies that. And then someone in the question kind of mentioned, you know, the problem that they're worried about around detection is that there could be false positives and there's also going to be evolution over time, right? And I agree 100%, which is why um, we're focused more on the prevention versus detection. Um, we have a question, what are the average percentages of known non-AI generated essays? I I don't know the answer to that in terms of the AI detection tools. Um, so that would be an interesting thing to follow up on and do some more research on, but don't have that stat for you today. Yeah, and then we had a, someone who kind of did exactly what I had described, where uh, they referenced a very specific case in their textbook. And they were saying that the student, the student's response just had totally false information in it. And then, you know, kind of asking, perhaps this student used AI. I certainly don't want to accuse anyone of anything, but the fact that you referenced that uh, specific case in your textbook, that was a great idea. And certainly what I'd recommend doing moving forward where you can protect yourself, right? Because now the student, if they did use AI, they produced a poor response, which in turn, you probably graded them with a, a poor score. So, you know, 
you've essentially achieved the outcome in preventing someone from, from gaining your assessment. Uh, so there was also a question, does this apply mostly to essay or open-ended type exams? Does it apply to multiple choice? I definitely focus primarily on the AI, like chat GPT side of things with the tips and tricks and things of that nature. But if we think back to the uh, beginning where we talked about, you know, these different versions of these tools, um, chat GPT or uh, things like transcript. So this slide. On the right hand side, these these are pure answer generating applications. So if you're doing a, if you're using a multiple choice assessment, transcript is going to tell the student the likelihood that A is the right answer, right? Coursology, Quizzard, QuizWiz, similar type tools. And again, this overlays the transcript and other interfaces right on the top of your assessment, and the student can just one click of a button. Now, obviously, if you're using Honorlock, that's not the case because we're going to block these trans these uh, extensions, and so the student won't have access. But um, I will also mention that of the extensions that we block. Transcript is far and away the most common that we see. So that one seems to have caught or, or be trending the most on the student side. And that's like a subscription service where the students pay, I think it's $5 a month to have access to it to be able to get those answers. And it does work with every major LMS, as far as I know. Um, so certainly some things to be mindful of, even if you're delivering mostly multiple choice exams. All right, skimming through some other questions. So does browser guard, excuse me, does browser guard um, already block AI tools like ChatGPT? So with browser guard turned on, assuming that you don't have any whitelisted websites, we're going to prevent students from navigating out to other tabs or to other things in their browser. So they're not gonna be able to go to OpenAI's site and access ChatGPT. Now you might, if you are electing to use one of those tips around how do I leverage AI in my assessment, then you can still turn browser guard on, but you can whitelist or you can allow the URL for chat GPT and let the students go there and do their work and then come back to their test. And that way, you know, that's the only tool that they're able to access. So there's complete flexibility within browser guard, but by default, assuming you're not allowing any access to any other sites, yes, the student won't be able to navigate away and get to chat GPT on their device. And then we have those other safeguards in place for secondary devices if they should be trying there. Um, all right, we still have a, about half a dozen or so other questions. Can we detect these extensions was a question that comes through. So uh, we, we do have all of the extensions tracked and part of your semester uh, semester business review with Honorlock is you're going to be have some of this data shared with you around what are the most common extensions at your institution that are being blocked and how are students utilizing them. We also are working on a admin dashboard that would make that data available to you, uh, you know, ad hoc at your fingertips whenever you'd like to pull it up. So the intention on our end is absolutely to expose some of that extension blocking data back to you at the institutions so that you can have some insights into it. And then we had a couple of questions that seem to be confused around the extensions and, and just, I will reiterate. We are, um, and I'll give you even the background on how our process works around extension blocking so that we all understand. So we've elected to block uh, a large batch of extensions that are all potentially cheating related. These are AI tools, these are things like transcript. And so Honorlock shuts those down and make sure the student can't use them. Also, what we're doing simultaneously is behind the scenes, we are consistently analyzing our data around which new extensions are popping up, right? Because sure, we're gonna shut down Transcript, we're gonna shut down Coursology and Quizzard and all these, but there's no, there's no uh, stopping the next one from coming up in the future. So as students start to install those other extensions, we track that, we report on it, and we can see, oh, there's a new extension that seems to be gaining steam. We've had 100 students pop into an exam with uh, you know, some new extension enabled. Then we have a review process to analyze what the purpose of that extension is. And if it is something that should not be allowed during a test, we will then immediately add it to our list of blocked extensions. And that goes into effect the second that we kind of switch that toggle over. So just to be clear, 
yes, we block all of these key extensions that we talked about today, and we are staying ahead of the curve so that we can continue to stay ahead of what's going to come down the pipe. By default, uh, we had some questions around what types of settings do you need to use to make sure that all of this stuff works. So when you enable Honor Lock, um, there are institution defaults that can be set up for your for your school. So I don't want to speak for everyone, right? Because your institution might have certain defaults in place that others don't have. But I will say that the majority of our customers have Browser Guard enabled by default, meaning when you turn on Honor Lock, the key function, and Browser Guard is the most important part of all the things that I talked about, it, you will automatically have all of these benefits that I've explained, right? Where extensions will be blocked, access to other sites will be blocked, copy and paste will be blocked. So definitely confirm with you know your key admin or whoever's kind of in charge of your, your proctoring settings that that's the case at your institution. But if you see Browser Guard turned on when you enable Honor Lock, then you're good to go on the majority of what I've referenced today. Also, just to reiterate there, um, if you turn off copy and paste, that will block it entirely, meaning also within the assessment itself. Uh, we have a question that kind of came through where I believe this person may want to allow students to copy and paste in certain scenarios within the test. So in that world, you would want to disable that. You disable or, well, you would allow copy and paste to, to clarify. and. Um, when with that allowed, you're still going to reap the benefits of the student not being able to navigate to other tabs. You're still going to reap the benefits of, you know, shutting down the extensions. So a lot of the key components that would prohibit AI use are still in play, but you can allow them to copy and paste within that test if it's something that they need to do to take that exam effectively. Uh, I will answer maybe three or four more. There's a lot of questions and I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, but just trying to skim and pick out the one that might be most beneficial to the whole group. Yeah, and I, I did want to say, Jordan, if there's any specific questions anyone has about, um, you know, using Honor Lock or actually how you're using it in your LMS, I'm going to share our knowledge base link in the chat. And that has a lot of um, how to articles and tutorials. Um, as well as our customer success team. So feel free to use those resources as well if we don't get to your question. So we have one here that's a, a good one. So just this this question says, just curious if a proctor gets involved in quotations, what does that entail? You know, what happens? And I did kind of talk about our proctors without going into detail on this. So what I mean by that is when um, a proctor gets alerted of a potential academic violation, right, which is triggered through a variety of our AI detection tools, uh, then the proctor will essentially open up an investigation window where the student is not yet interrupted. So should there be a flag that was incorrectly marked or anything like that, the student does not know, they don't get bothered because we don't want the student to get any added stress uh, when it's not necessary. The proctor will open this evaluation window and they'll observe and make sure that, all right, is that, uh, what do I need to do with this flag? the student got flagged for a second person being in the room, but I open up this window and I can see that that second person is their child, right? Or their son came in and said that they needed dinner. The proctor is not going to bother the student in that scenario. There's no cheating risk there. So that that's step one, is the proctor is going to weed out anything that does not need intervention and that doesn't require us to, uh, to interrupt the student. But assuming there's something legitimate going on, and um, maybe the student was flagged for multi-device detection and now the proctors popped in and they can see oh yeah they're, they're using their phone the proctor is going to try to de-escalate the situation and get the student back on track right so goal number one for our proctors is to try to stop the action as soon as possible so in this case maybe they would ask the student to power down their phone or to you know move it into another room and they would verify this is being done on camera and then the student would return they maybe ask them to do a room scan to confirm that that phone's out of the area and then the student can continue their test. I will say the, the concept of de-escalation is very important to us. So when a proctor pops in, just under 90% of the time, we are able to de-escalate the, the situation without creating a violation. And that I think is an important distinction between how Honor Lock approaches things and perhaps other 
Procter and Companies is we want to stop the cheating before it gets started, essentially, so that you don't have to deal with it as an institution. So if we can get there before the student uses that phone, or we can get there before the student does X, Y, or Z, and de-escalate and get that thing out of the testing area, that's a huge benefit. The student, you know, maybe they won't receive a failing score by their instructor. You as an instructor don't have to deal with academic court and all the headaches that come with that. And, you know, we've saved you time and hopefully created a positive or at least a more positive experience for that student because now they understand, all right, I'm back on track. Let me take my test, do the best I can. So that's really our focus is that de-escalation piece. All right. Um... All right, I'll pick one more here. So can, there was, there was a variety of questions around multi-device detection and we've got about three minutes. So I think it's a good topic to, to close on. So I think there's three, uh, there's, there's more than three, but I'll focus on three. There's really the three main components that I talked about around multi-device detection. The first one is completely preventative and puts the tool in the instructor's hand that's search and destroy because Using a secondary device doesn't matter as much if the content isn't leaked online. I'm not going to find it, right? If I go to use my other device to, to search for a question, if I can't find the question, I might not be able to get to an answer. That's certainly not foolproof, but that is, uh, it's better if that's the outcome than you know, the alternative of them easily Googling and finding the answer. So search and destroy is gonna allow you to make sure your content is not out there online. Multi-device detection itself, right, is going to be um, when a student Googles a question and lands on certain sites, Honor Lock is aware of these sites and we are able to flag those incidents. And in those worlds, right, you're gonna end up with a screen recording of the student, you're gonna end up with an audio watermark that confirms the student landed on one of these sites and tried to access the answer. And they're never gonna see an answer on these sites either. So they're only gonna find the question. So the, the, the benefit to you is, you know, your questions are not out there with, with answers and you're gonna have hard evidence that a student was Googling, trying to find this response because you're gonna have video, you're gonna have an audio watermark and you should have a pretty closed cut uh, or a closed ended button up case. Then the other element to that is what we're doing uh, recently with Apple Handoff. And our intention is to expand this to other device, detection, um, device sharing applications as well. If a student is on a second device, an Apple handoff is enabled and they're logged in using the same Apple ID. It has nothing to do with like their test window or honor lock being installed on another computer. All right. So just to be clear on that, if I'm taking my test on my MacBook and then I have my iPhone over here, I'm logged in with the same Apple ID on both. We're going to be able to detect if the student goes on and uses their browser on their phone or if they open up their uh, text messages and they're trying to you know, cheat with the student using text message and a whole other variety of applications. And that's going to expand beyond just Apple handoff and go to other applications that would you know, work with Android and other uh, OSs as well. So hopefully that clarifies those key uh, three points. And then there's a whole other slew of other things too, right? If a student is looking off screen, they may be looking at a second device and Honor Lock's gonna flag that and we'll jump in. Um, the room scan helps prevent a second device from being in the area. Keyword detection allows, you know, if a student says, hey, Google, hey, Siri, we're going to detect that and flag it. So really, the overall honor lock package, so much of it is designed to prevent, deter, detect the use of a second device. So I hope that clears that up a bit. And I apologize, I couldn't get to all the questions. Um, I definitely would encourage you, like Olivia suggested, follow up with your uh, CSMs with questions, and we will be more than happy to try to give you detailed responses, but uh, appreciate a good chunk of you hanging around to, to go through the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, we will be sending out those links as well as the recording. Uh, thank you for your participation in the polls. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody.